voltage and how you create the plasma and the frequency at which you, you drive the plasma. And so what happens is an ion will come in and every once in a while that ion will cause part of the surface to eject out because of energy and momentum transfer, right? And so sputtering uh, tends to be uh, a little bit more, uh, well, certainly it, it potentially can have higher rates. Here's an, a comparison uh, between evaporation and sputtering, right? So um, you can get, e evaporation potentially can have uh, 1,000 atomic layers per second, but sputtering can give you much, much tighter control. Um, the the uh, choice of materials is, is you know, pretty similar. I mean, you can't evaporate everything. So in sputtering, a lot of times you can take different sources and put them in the same chamber. Uh, but you could imagine that if I had uh, if I had two different materials and I wanted them both to deposit, and I tried to do it with thermal evaporation, well, they would kind of have to have the same thermodynamic behavior uh, uh, because I, it would be hard to, to get them at different at significantly different temperatures whereas in sputtering you're controlling this ion process and you can co-sputter you can put uh, you can sputter two different materials um, you can so there's very little control over stoichiometry and evaporation but in sputtering you can have very good control so if you want to put down a, uh, a film where you're controlling the elemental composition, then sputtering is certainly the way to go. Um, you also have, um, you know, sputtering is easier to, to scale up because, again, it's a plasma process and you kind of spread that plasma over a large area, whereas evaporation, an E beam evaporation event, right, it is a single beam. And so it doesn't really scale to large areas in the same way. Um, you also get much better adhesion with sputtering, which is, which is important. Uh, a lot of times in our lab, we'll be working on problems and we'll, we need the metal layers that we are depositing to stick to the substrate because in the functional setting, uh, they, if they delaminate, our, our device is, is broken. Um, and so, so sputtering helps um, with that quite a bit. Now, most of what I'll talk about <coughs> for the rest of this lecture involves chemical vapor deposition. So in chemical vapor deposition, you actually send different gases into your chamber and they react. They might just, the reaction might be just a simple decomposition or it might be a reaction between uh, the, the gases that you send in. And you could also enhance that process by, uh, by using a plasma, for example. So you can break down your, your precursor gases um, in, a way that, uh, in a way that makes them much more reactive with the surface. So, in, so chemical vapor deposition, these chambers are usually you know, more complicated in the sense that you have to feed the, the gases, so there's more gas handling that, that has to be done. But they don't have to operate at such low pressures. Um, in fact, sometimes you can do, do them close to atmospheric pressure. And, uh, and then if you just do thermal chemical vapor deposition, you just need really a tube furnace, which is fairly ubiquitous now. So if you look at this, <coughs> what we do with, with chemical vapor deposition uh, in general is we try to make uh, unique crystalline materials that we otherwise could not for example, sputter, because if we tried to sputter them, uh, they would break down and they wouldn't land on the surface the way that we would want them to. So, so we're actually trying to control crystallinity more in the chemical vapor deposition process than we do in physical vapor deposition. There's some interesting, and um, I, I think it's fun. I'm a mechanical engineer. I, I, I didn't make that confession earlier um, because I just forgot. but. But uh, if you wanted to analyze chemical vapor deposition processes, you have to do fluid mechanics, right? And so this is where mechanical engineers tend to work. Chemical engineers, too. We have some in the audience, right? And so in this case, <coughs> what you see is, again, in that tube furnace, you'd have, 
your gas is flowing over your growth substrate. And at the beginning of the growth substrate, you'd actually start what's called a boundary layer. And in order to really know what's happening, to know how these gases and the, the products of whatever reaction is happening in the gas phase, to understand how, how frequently they're reaching the surface or what, with what flux they're reaching the surface, you have to be able to understand that boundary layer process. In fact, in chemical vapor deposition systems, one, one issue is that you'll have non-uniform growth because of boundary layers, right? Because this has a smaller boundary layer. So let's say that my flow had a certain concentration in the free stream away outside of the boundary layer of, of a species that I wanted to deposit onto the substrate. Well, if that were the case, then here, where the boundary layer at the leading edge, where the boundary layer is thinner, I would get more of it than I would downstream where the boundary layer is thicker and that diffusion has to, move, has to go farther in order to reach the surface, okay? So there's some interesting fluid mechanics that go with that. Um, and, I, and I wanted to, to point this slide out simply because um, I think it's a, it's a good application of fluid mechanics and mechanical engineering, but to really what is you know, potentially a science pro problem if you're, if you're really looking at the fundamentals of, uh, of high temperature chemistry in these systems. <coughs> All right, so I'm going to now change gears a bit and talk about carbon nanomaterials and 3D uh, materials in particular. <coughs> so here's a something that you're going to hear a lot from me about not only today but in the, in the lectures to come. Um, graphitic petals. Sometimes I think they're written as nano petals. They are nano but it gets to be a little bit redundant. Um, so so they're, they're petals. They're like flower petals. And this work uh, actually started with a postdoc, um, Bhuvana, who was a PhD student in Professor Kulkarni's uh, group and then came to the US to be a postdoc with me. And we grew these petals off of a carbon fiber. This is a graphitized carbon fiber like you would find in a composite material. Um, and we actually <coughs> used a chemical vapor deposition process, but in this case with a plasma, to grow these petals out of the surface of that material. And we could grow them very sh short if we use a, a, a short amount of time, um, kind of a medium level at the bottom right. And if we, um, if we let it grow longer or where we had more plasma concentration, then we could get really, really, really thick uh, layers and layers of petals. I'm gonna go back a step though and just talk about uh, the kind of the precursor to all this, and that's a carbon nanotube. You've heard about this. Professor Kulkarni mentioned carbon nanotubes earlier today. <coughs> a carbon nanotube <coughs> is what it sounds like, uh, but it is, it's the graphitic phase of carbon uh, where you have these layered structures. So, so graphitic phase has a, a two-dimensional nature to the, to the crystal structure, and then they layer on top of each other. Right. You probably all know this, but in case you don't, I just wanted to make sure. And in this case, this carbon nanotube has six walls. Okay, so that's a multi-walled carbon nanotube. Sometimes they only have one, and you can make them, you can, you can control your process so that you get one or more. Uh, it's hard to control exactly how many you have if it's more than one. Uh, but, but those are, are graphene, <coughs> those are s cylindrical graphene planes uh, in those walls. It, it makes for a really interesting material on, on a number of different levels. <coughs> in our case, I wanted to <coughs> I wanted to, to talk about we've done some some synthesis of those carbon nanotubes um, in the in a three-dimensional way uh, where we took a, a block of metal, in this case aluminum with a very thin layer of iron and then aluminum underneath that and titanium as our sticky metal on the bottom. And then we anodized it so that we, we, we exposed, so the anodization process in this case makes the material porous. It makes it, it oxidizes it and it makes it porous, okay? And when, when it went, when the porosity came through, 
So this, this is essentially vertical cylinders formed. Then we left iron in the wall. And from that, the iron is a catalyst. So you heard about catalysis today too, right, already. Iron is a catalyst for carbon nanotubes. So this is a very complicated process. That, that's why I have, I, I included it here. We're not going to talk about that structure very much. The point I want to make is that that took a lot of effort and you don't get very much out at the end. So all the metal deposition, the oxidation you have to do, making those holes, and then putting it in your chamber and growing some nanotubes out of the, out of the pores. It's a very, very uh, lengthy and expensive process. On the, on the other side, <coughs> on the other hand, this, uh, these petals, so that's what, that's what these are. These petals uh, don't require any catalyst. They don't require any metal to be deposited beforehand. Um, they just come out. And so that's, that's kind of, uh, I think, a good contrast. So back to those petals. If we look at these, <coughs> we used plasma CVD to grow these, to grow these petals. Um, we have about, well, nearly a billion of them per square centimeter. Right, so there's a lot of petals uh, on this, and, and each, each edge is about a micron or so. Um, it's simple and fast to make, and again, you know, this was done about five, six years ago, um, and then, and then we've, we've taken it from there. The way that we grow it, that's really what I want to talk about. <coughs> the way that we grow it is in a microwave uh, chemical vapor deposition system. So in this case, here's a, a picture of the system, and I'm, I'll have more to say about it. Uh, in a bit, but we have a stage that we can heat that's at the bottom, um, and then we have a, a dielectric spacer that we use to elevate our sample, which in this case I told you we were growing on carbon fibers as our starting material. Um, we elevate to kind of move it into the plasma so that the plasma will couple to it. It becomes like an antenna, actually. And so now we have this very, very intense high temperature environment right around that that material. In this case, it's, a, it's a, a cluster of carbon fibers. To tell you a little bit more about, the, about this system and what it can do, in this case, we use uh, hydrogen and methane are the main gases that we use in the process. Um, we can bias the substrate electrically so we can control. Again, if you have a plasma environment, that means you have charged particles. You have a, a, a potential field inside of your growth chamber, so you, you could actually uh, use this substrate bias, which is just a, a high voltage power supply basically, to control your charge a little bit. And so people do that, it gets even more complicated. Uh, we, can, we can control temperature. Um, we, we can't control the, uh, the frequency of the microwave. That's, that's fixed at two and a half gigahertz, but we can we can control the, uh, the power that we put in. And we just lost, speaking of power that we put in, we just lost uh, something. Should I stop? Um, okay, it's back up, good. Sorry. Are we still streaming? Yes, okay, good, all right. So, so this is what the chamber looks like. Um, we can move the, move the stage up and down. And, and we use that and, and you know, essentially change the chemistry, change the power, change the flow rate, change the pressure, the thermodynamic environment in order to tune what we want to make. So some really nano things here. Um, and I, I'm glad we, we have uh, we moved to these screens because I think you can, you can see it a little bit better here. Um, you'll be able to get the lights off. But this is, what we're showing here is, is transmission electron micrographs, and we're going to have a, a lecture about uh, TEM as well. But you see these petals that are growing out of the carbon fiber. And if you really look carefully at these images, you'll see, you'll see striations or, or you'll see lines, uh, curved lines that, re that correspond to the graphene planes the basal planes that are moving from the fiber on the right out into the petal, which means that those petals are attached to the fiber covalently with covalent bonds. 
And so that was a really pleasant thing for us to see because <clears throat> the petals don't flake off. Now if we overgrow, then we'll put layers of petals on top of petals, and then the top layers will, will flake off sometimes. But that bottom layer is very, very robust. So we'll, later on in this week, we'll also talk about, we'll talk about durability of, of materials, um, failure modes of materials, and that's one of the big problems with many of the uh, of nanomaterials, nanoparticles, nanoflakes, is that they start out working really well, and then later on they they don't, right? They lose their uh, their performance, and most of the time when they lose their performance, it is a some kind of delamination or decrepitation process, okay? But in this case, um, we, we're happy that, that these petals uh, don't do that, at least that bottom layer of petals. We've grown them on a lot of different substrates. So again, this is a three-dimensional material, a three-dimensional carbon material. We've even grown them <coughs> on top of carbon nanotubes. So we can take a carbon nanotube array. That's the third uh, from the left. We take a carbon nanotube array and then grow petals on that. So we actually did, it's, it's, it's kind of funny because uh, some people will call these this array of carbon nanotubes. It looks like a turf, but sometimes they call it a forest. But the carbon nanotubes alone, it, it's a dead forest if, if it's that because they don't have any leaves or petals. But we grew the petals on and we